Compounds, you know, like salt and sodium chloride, NaCl, those are going to dissociate into their ions, the, the sodium positive ions and the negative chlorine ions. And they're just going to float around in solution. That will conduct electricity. Okay, if you have moving ions, that's something you're going to learn can conduct electricity. You can't conduct electricity otherwise. Okay, a solid ionic compound cannot conduct electricity because those ions are stationary. They can't transfer the flow of electrons. You'll learn that electricity is just the movement of electrons. That's all it is. That's all it is. Okay. Um, now, the ionization energies, electron affinities, and electron negativities of bonded atoms provide information about the nature of a chemical bond. Okay. I talked about this with you all earlier in class today. Okay. Um, and effective nuclear charge, which I talked about, explains every one of those trends. I already explained to Tom Gradius to you all, right? Okay. And it, it'll explain every one of those trends. Um, and I'll briefly talk about it. So everyone understands that as you go from right to left on a periodic table, you're increasing proton by one, right? So it's increasing the positive charge of the nucleus, right? So it's making, so first of all, as you go from right, on the left, right to the left on the periodic table, that's creating more attraction for the valence electrons that decreases atomic radius, right? Okay, now going top to bottom on the periodic table, you're just adding shells to the nucleus. So naturally you're gonna increase the, the radius, right? Okay, you guys, have all learned that I'm just teaching you. Just you'll learn it. You'll 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 know it just by thinking of effective nuclear charge. Okay. Now electronegativity. That's another trend. That's just the attraction a nucleus has for electrons. Same thing as effective nuclear charge. Okay. So as you move from right to left, okay, on the periodic table, you're adding a proton, gaining a positive charge. So you're just it's gaining more attraction for negative electrons, right? Just the definition of you know effective nuclear charge. Okay. Then um, ionization, uh, what is the ionization energy is the energy it takes to remove an electron or valence electron from a nucleus. Okay, so as you move from right to left on a periodic table, we're increasing the positive core, creating more traction for those new, for those valence electrons. So do you think it's going to be more difficult to pull those electrons off as we move from right to left? Exactly. Yeah. So the ionization energy will increase. It takes more energy to rip off that electron. Okay. And similarly to before, as we go from top to bottom, those electrons are located on farther and farther shells away from the nucleus. Since they're farther away, they're going to be less attracted to that nucleus. It's easier to rip them off. Okay, so ionization potential decreases from top to bottom. You just you don't have to memorize these trends anymore. Most people will teach you just memorize atomic radius decreases from right to left. You don't need to memorize that. You just remember you just remember effective nuclear charge. Okay. Um, and then finally, uh, table one shows the electronegativities of certain main. Okay, so now that uh, look at this table, okay, electronegativities of selected elements, they're just showing you the Pauling scale of electronegativity, okay, which I already talked about, I already anticipated. Um, I already even told you fluorine has a value of four. And that's just something I know because I've seen this table tested on the MCAT. Um, and that's a table, they love they loved to test on this stuff. So it's there. Okay, and remember I told you if you if you take two atoms and you subtract their electronegativity values, if the difference is greater than 1.7, it's an ionic bond. Okay, if it's around 1.7, it's a polar covalent bond, and if it's much less than 1.7, it's a covalent bond. Okay, now how easy do you think this looks? Like you guys have never seen me, you've never met me before, you've never seen this passage, I've never seen this passage. Given all the information I just told you about, how easy? How, do you, are you very confident? going through these questions, or are you, are you confused? Is so everyone, yeah? Yeah, good, good. This is all it takes. This is what I do for every passage, okay? Um, now the important part, questions, okay? I'll, I'll say the, state the question, and I'll come up with my own answer. A lot of the time, I'll already hypothesize the answer, okay? Um, with respect to bonding and electrical conductivity, respectively, sulfur hexafluoride, uh, SF6, would best be described as, okay, so I just look at S and I look at F. Okay, so S is on that table, it's uh, in group six, okay, has an electronegativity of 2.5, and uh, fluorine has an electronegativity of four, okay. So, first of all, now I have to think, is it, okay, so subtract four minus 2.5 is around 1.5, so it probably is around a polar covalent bond, okay. Now, the question is, uh, okay, so, Already, I know, you know, okay, so already it's not going to be B or D, okay? So it's either A or, or A or C. 
So now the question is, is it a conductor? Okay. Now, I already, I already discussed this. Remember, the only things that act as a conductor are solids that are dissolved, because those are free-floating ions. Okay. This is a covalent bond that covalent bonds don't associate. They're going to stick together as. So I would choose a non-conductor. Okay. Um, so mark, mark answer A. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, where are non-metals found in the periodic table? Okay, this is just something you probably have to memorize. Um, so all the halogens, halogens are gases. Those are all on the right side of the periodic table, right? Um, yeah, I would just say the right side, A. Okay, which of the following pairs of compounds provides an example of ionic and covalent bonding? Okay, you see how ridiculously easy this question is? You just subtract the electronegativity values, you'll know. Okay, so ionic, uh, so H, we have to use elimination because you have to evaluate every one of these. HBr, is that going to be ionic or covalent? Well, H is electronegativity value of one. Well, they don't give that to you, but you'll know that's, that's the lowest electronegativity value. You'll learn that in class. Um, Br has electronegativity value of 2.8. So 2.8 minus one is 1.8. So it's like, it's, Basically, I would think of it more as around polar covalent, so probably not the best answer. And sodium chloride, you'll know in class, sodium chloride dissociates into positive sodium, negative chlorine, that's definitely ionic. Okay, so answer A is wrong. Uh, sodium chloride is, is solid, so that part B, answer B, that's, that might be good. Now sodium and iodine, now look at their values. Sodium is a value of 0.9, uh, iodine is a value of 2.5, so subtract that, that gives you 1.6. Okay, that's pretty good, right? That's right under 1. Point, uh, what did I tell you? 1. Point, 1. 7. 1. 7. So that, that should be covalent. Okay, that's a pretty good answer. Uh, just looking at the rest of them, C, sodium iodine is not ionic, so that's wrong. Sodium chloride and HBr. Okay, so it's H. Okay, so so now it's between B and D. Um, HBr. Okay, so D HBr. What's the difference? 1.8, so that's kind of getting close to ionic, right? I would choose B as the best answer. Hydrogen has about the same electronegativity as carbon, so it's like right. CBr. They right. are the same. That's why hydrocarbons are nonpolar. Right, right. So it's like CBr, so. That's the difference of these. Oh, so, oh, okay, well, let's see. Um, well, sodium iodine, you know, sodium is on the very right side of the periodic table. And iodine is, on, I'm sorry, uh, iodine is for your, no, sodium is going to be on your left side, iodine's on the very right side. So remember I mentioned if something's on the very, your very left side, something's on the very right side, it's probably going to be an ionic compound. Okay, so that's not the best answer. You guys see why? One, the one on the left is going to gain an electron, the one on the right side of the PR table is going to, no, I'm sorry, the one on the, your left is going to lose an electron, the one on the, your right side is going to gain an electron. That's an ionic bond. So I would not choose NA, NA, I would not choose answer choice B. I would choose answer choice D. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Does it help that it's the HBR is a gas and then the acid is That does help. That's good information. Very good. Very good. I didn't even didn't even think about that. Okay, where did they say that? The passage says many covalent compounds are liquid gases. Oh, okay, good. Very good. You picked up on it. Very good. Okay. So, anyways, answer choice D, right? Okay. Um, number four, which of the following compounds has the most ionic compound, uh, ionic character? Okay. Most people will have no idea what that means. Okay. You all will know because it's just the one that has the highest, it's the two atoms that have the highest difference in electronegativity. So just evaluate them. KBR, what's, uh, subtract their electronegativity values, what do you get? Two. Okay, so that has some ionic character. Uh, CS and chlorine, what's the difference? So CS is. CS isn't on there, but it's right below. It would be like 28. Okay, so if you look at your periodic table, it's right below. Where's CZ on that? Um, it's on the first column. It's on the first column? Yeah, it's right below rubidium. Right below rubidium. So you just, it's going to be similar to rubidium. Very good pickup, okay? Um, and chlorine is 3, so 3 minus 0.8 is around 2.2. So that's so far our best answer, right? Okay, good. Uh, what about sodium iodine? 1.6. 1.6, so that's not the best answer, right? Uh, rubium or RBBR, 